Hi, everybody. Um, I have to say that somehow Lauren and I prepared the content for a course in machine learning, introduction to machine learning, as opposed to a one hour lecture. So uh, I will try, but uh, my goal is to actually give you the information that you can then take and use in your practice and to give you the information that you understand uh, that, uh, when others uh, give you the results of some of these uh, applications of methodologies and things like that. So I uh, please feel free to stop me and to ask questions and we'll go at the pace that uh, is hopefully comfortable for most of you. And um, if you have, yes, definitely ask if you have any questions. So just briefly, uh, there are many objectives, but one is uh, we'll talk about the uh, data integration technique that we have developed, but is broadly used, uh, which is called Similarity Network Fusion. Then we'll talk about the cluster analysis, the many techniques that I use in the cluster analysis. And then if there is time, because that would be slide 60, would be the, the classif building classifiers. But uh, the slides uh, you have, I think Anne said that she had shared. So if you have any questions about building classifiers and we don't get to them, I'll be happy to go uh, over them with you. So the reason why we have actually developed this uh, data integration technique, which is called Similarity Network Fusion, is that more and more often, um, there's a lot of different and very heterogeneous kinds of data that is being collected on the same set of patients. So you get a set of patients and you might have methylation data on them, methylation and uh, mRNA and microRNA and um, other epigenetic data, but you can also have the non-gene related data, non even uh, omic related data, such as uh, the clinical data, right? So related to here is the diet. So this was the case in our um, IBD study and the inflammatory bowel disease study. And so uh, that's, that's, that's one concern, is that the data we get on the same set of patients is very heterogeneous. <coughs> and the other, um, the two others is that we have a lot of measurements, but very often very few patients. So in classical statistics, we really like when we have a few measurements and lots of patients. But that's unfortunately not the case in omics data lots of measurements and few patients. So we have to take that into account. And also, we, um, the different data flows, they provide different kinds of information. So sometimes it's uh, one confirms the other, and sometimes it contradicts the other. And how do we take advantage of all of that uh, uh, kind of difference in the signal? So uh, this is uh, what we have developed. It's a, it's a method with two steps. The first is to um, generate a network. And here, a network is the similarity, represents similarity between individuals according to that data type. So as many of the types of data that you have, uh, you will have as many networks. So the, each edge in this, each uh, dot and node in this network represents a patient. Uh, and each edge represents how similar they are. So the stronger, the more colorful in this particular representation, the more similar they are or the closer they are to each other. And so here, actually, this is an example of, of uh, TCGA uh, glioblastoma data set. This is the real data that you are seeing, not on the left, but this is, uh, this three come from the real data set. And uh, so once you have constructed these networks, we have um, a nonlinear approach, which is, um, um, which I will talk about in more detail uh, as we go, and it combines all of these networks. So it already doesn't necessarily care where the um, data has come from. What it cares about is that it's in a space of similarities. And once we're in the space of the similarities, we can actually combine all of this data. That's, that's the key point of this approach. Um, so here's an example. Um, and we have lots of examples because we work with lots of different kinds of data. So here's an example. Um, of non-omics data, but you can imagine the same for, for your data, whatever data you have. We were just trying to give 
very very different types of uh, uh, examples and different types of uh, data. So here we had a clinical cohort of 80 samples, and all of them were OCD diagnosed. And what we wanted to identify is the subtypes of OCD from this data. So we had the clinical data, and we had two types of neuroimaging data: so magnetic magnetic resonance and the structural uh, resonance imaging. So for each individual, we have these three different types of measures. Interesting. Sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't work. So uh, this is kind of what the data, uh, schematic for what the data looks like. We have a matrix. We have each row represents a patient, and the measurements according to this particular type of measurement. So here it was brain structure. And we had, um, and sometimes it goes three at a time. Maybe I will put this down. So um, we had uh, brain structure, we had the metabolite concentrations, and we had the clinical features. So three <coughs> different matrices represented like this. And the patients are all the same. So what we do is we kind of integrate out the information about what type of measurement it is. So we uh, essentially look at the distance or the similarity between patients. And now we'll actually go over the different distance metrics that you can use in this context. And once we have the patient-by-patient -patient similarity, this, in a sense, is actually equivalent to a network. So if you were just to look at the correlation, say, between all pairs of patients, you will be able to construct such a matrix. But it would be full matrix, and your network would be a full network. So what we do is usually we sparsify this matrix to result in a, in a network that you see here. And the specification is just based on who is most similar. So you just remove the, one, the, pa uh, the links between patients that are not similar enough. So we did this for all the three different types of data. And we got the three different networks. And then we integrated. And um, I want to uh, give you a sense of kind of, of what it does. So the, imagine this example where we have just two clusters of points, and we are trying to figure out um, what, what, what is the true clustering in the data. So this is the true clustering, this we don't see. What we see is the one on top where, where some portion of the points is relabeled, so it looks like it's part of the other cluster, whereas it is really not. And on the other type of data, another portion is relabeled from the second cluster. So in some sense, you are getting partial information from both of the types of data, which is quite common. So this is simulated data to simulate the, re the reality that we commonly experience. So when you have such information, you actually can use the similarity network fusion and combine all these networks to result in the uh, joint cluster, which gives you uh, essentially the original uh, clustering that you would want to find. So this is, yeah, this is just uh, the performance of the metrics with respect to how much noise there is in the data, so how many points are labeled. And these are some of them are uh, competing approaches uh, that do not perform as well. So in our original network, what that means is that even if we have information from uh, just one type of data, and it's not captured in the other types, if this information is fairly strong, so the similarity is fairly strong, it can propagate to the joint, the integrated, uh, network um, without uh, having it um, being uh, complete and all the others. So here's another example of different kinds of noise in the data, also very, very common. So here, again, the ground truth is not seen. In uh, the top uh, perturbation, there is a Gaussian noise. In the bottom, the perturbation is a gamma noise. All you have to know is that this is kind of a different types of noise, like the normal white, white type noise, but one of them, for example, this gamma noise, it actually has a tail, right? So there are lots of values in there. Yeah. And so you see that both of them provide um, information about the clustering, the original clustering, but there is a, a lot of this old diagonal noise, which you kind of don't want in your data. So once you use this noise in a confusion, it actually integrates the data, removing a lot of this noise. So if these uh, uh, noise were reinforced, so both if they were identical, then, of course, you fuse and you get the same exact matrix, right? But if the noise is different and it's weak, right, compared to the signal, then you actually get um, that noise drop out and you get a much stronger signal 
floppiness. So that's uh, the example here. Is this edge the similarity between these two individuals was only one data set? It was fairly weak, and so it disappeared when we combined uh, the three networks. Uh, we uh, applied this approach um, to several different uh, examples. Uh, one was published uh, in Kansas Cell last year, was in pancreatic TCG um, consortium. Uh, another one is, uh, is a completely different one, also using imaging data, was in psychiatric dis disorder subtyping. We used clinical, combined clinical, and I think we'll kind of wait for the updating. Huh. And where did it go? It'll be here somewhere, right? Here. So, um, we combine methylation data and clinical data, and also we are doing some similar work for uh, inflammatory disorders. So basically, this is just to tell you that there are many different types of data that you can combine to achieve this uh, similarity and the clustering. So now, um, I will talk about clustering, but I will um, first talk about distances. So I want to make a distinction before I move to clustering that uh, the similarity network fusion, it actually provides you uh, similarity across all patients. You don't have to cluster that data. Very often, you actually do want to cluster, right? You want to identify discrete subtypes in your population, patient population, or something else that you're doing, a gene set, right? You want to identify gene module. And you want to cluster your data. But um, depending on your, your goals, you don't necessarily have to cluster. That said, clustering is a very important and very integral part of the analysis of the omics data. And so that's what we will discuss next. Um, so you can cluster on single or multiple types of data. Uh, you can measure, um, you have to figure out what uh, signal you care about. So that's about the pre-processing of your data and figuring out how you would construct, for example, the similarity based on what, right, um, et cetera. So let me, let me switch to the distant metrics. So when, when clustering, you have to figure out how similar is one uh, instance to another instance, right, and whether they should be clustered together or not. So here's an example of a most commonly used metric. It's a Euclidean distance. And Euclidean distance here is shown in 2D uh, space. And you can see that it looks at the coordinates uh, back to early uh, school, uh, this, this kind of plots where you look at the, the difference between coordinates in x-axis, y-axis, et cetera. So the more generalized uh, the squared error, is uh, when you have n dimensions, and it's also still a sum across all of these dimensions. So this is the most, by far, the most common used metric in um, uh, for continuous variables. I want to bring you up another one. You might or might not have heard about it: the Mahalanobis uh, distance, which I used to call Mahanobis. Don't. Um, but the the point is that uh, this distance is a generalization is a ge generalization of the Euclidean distance. And very often, it is used instead of the, where you would normally use Euclidean distance. Why? It's because of this term. This term S is showing the covariance matrix between all your measurements. So when your measurements are all on the same space, uh, suppose you measure, I don't know, all weight, right? Uh, and it's all in the same space, and that's all fine. But if you're measuring height, weight, and maybe some other measures, other clinical measures, blood tests, whatever, then this, these are not on the same scale, these are not on the same. And people do some kind of normalization and standardization to uh, account for that. But another way to do it is to use the Mahalanobis distance directly and estimate this covariance matrix. So here, it will depend, the ultimate result, the ultimate distance will depend on your data. It will be constructed for your data. And this is very often used in, in machine learning for those of you who use those uh, kind of approaches. And you can see that the, 
uh, incorporating this covariance as allows you to model the distribution of the data better than the Euclidean distance that is shown here in the red concentric uh, circles. Um, but of course, you might have uh, not continuous but categorical variables, right? So you can have high, medium, low, for example, three categories for one of your measures. And in that case, um, well, Hammond distance is the number of mismatches. It can actually, here it's shown for binary data, and that's what people most commonly use. It, which metric you use here for binary and categorical data really depends on what you are trying to achieve, right? So, for example, in some cases, if you are looking at somatic mutations, and you have a very few mutations that you actually care about, and you, you only care, um, but if you have the same somatic mutation between two patients, that's actually the strong signal for you. So then you count just the, the similarity in terms of uh, the same somatic mutations, if they are present, right? Because if you are counting matches or mismatches, you would count also the ones where they are absent, right? There are large amounts of uh, genome where there are no somatic mutations, and that would dominate your metric if you uh, just counted matches or mismatches, right? So in very often, um, you have to stop to think about what distance metric you want to use. And this happens a lot in uh, any kind of uh, clustering that we do in our lab also, to kind of ensure that the distance metric will ultimately capture what we care about. Um, uh, finally, and more recently, there is a lot more uh, longitudinal data that's becoming available, so longitudinal or time series. In my mind, longitudinal is called when you have a few measurements over time, time series when you have lots of measurements or like hundreds of measurements over time. But it could be my own definition, it's just based on uh, my experience. Uh, but one of the most common metrics there is this uh, fresh distance. And uh, this is a cartoon that uh, Lauren found somewhere, which I think is great, um, which is, uh, it's a, it, so you are trying to compute the distance between the two curves. So between measurements over time of different types. And um, it's essentially the minimum uh, leash length that you need to, to be able to make that curve between the, the dog and the owner. But it, ultimately, it, it's equivalent to the max distance between these two curves. OK? Between the trajectories. Uh, one important point is sometimes the methods require distance, which means uh, the bigger is the number, the uh, more dissimilar the, the patients or the genes or whatever you're measuring are. But sometimes people look for similarity or dissimilarity, right? And that is kind of this inverse. So you can see here we have the Euclidean distance uh, that we have computed according to before. And if we want a similarity, so the equivalent uh, corresponding radial kernel similarity would be the one where you take one over the exponent, exponentiated uh, Euclidean distance. So here, in similarity, the higher the similarity, the more similar they are. So it's the, the opposite of the distance. Just to, just to make sure. We actually have a lot of, um, a lot of questions uh, in SNF because we, we do cluster. Uh, at the end, there were lots of questions from the users saying, I get exactly the opposite uh, kind of uh, uh, clustering. And what they were using was distance as opposed to similarity, which is what we were using. So it, it is important. OK? Are there any questions? I'll be switching to the clustering approaches. And I don't have a clock here, so I have no idea how I'm doing. Hmm? 220. Excellent. Might be able to go through it all. Questions? All right. So uh, common clustering approaches. The first approach that you have already heard about from Andre, from what I understand, is the hierarchical. I will then talk about k-means, Gaussian mixtures, and spectral clustering briefly. So uh, hierarchical clustering, uh, the idea is to cluster all the way to, to one cluster. So uh, the way that hierarchical clustering works is that you start with every instance or every, every item being in its own cluster, and then you're trying to merge them. 
that's that's the idea behind them. So at the end, you merge it all into one big cluster. So um, here, it basically, you computed your distance um, in hierarchical clustering. They are often called linkage functions. Um, but you compute your distance. So here, it looks like A and B are uh, uh, the closest to each other, and E, e and D are closest to each other. And so we have merged A and B into one cluster, E and D into another. In the second step, we identify that C is the closest to the AB cluster, and now ABC is a cluster, and D, D, E is a cluster, and then there is a separate F. So this is not part of the cluster. And this is the dendrogram in the bottom that corresponds to this clustering procedure. Um, the next one is F, and ultimately we have merged everything into uh, itself. So in some sense, this is, I would guess, the most commonly used clustering approach because it's so um, unassuming in some way. But it does depend on the distance metric, and it will give you a different clustering. And at some point, you will have to decide how many clusters they are because you, you, you have to cut this dendrogram somewhere. But at least it gives you an option of making that decision after the fact. Unlike the k-means, where you have to decide on the number of clusters before you actually cluster. So uh, the steps of k-means, and most of you have, might have heard of k-means. It's also incredibly, might be the second most common clustering technique. Um, so you choose the number of clusters, and then you set the, the centers randomly, essentially completely randomly. And then each point, you compute the distance of how close it is to each of the centers, and you assign the point to the cluster of the, with that center which, with which it, it is the closest to. So here, you got the red points assigned to one cluster and the yellow points assigned to another cluster. Then you, once you have made the assignment of all the points, you recompute the center and you repeat the procedure. So you recompute the center, right? You now have this evidence that all the red points are in the cluster, so you will looking to move the center to here because that's the central point of this cluster. Um, and so you recompute and repeat until convergence. Obviously, this procedure converges intuitively, but there is also a proof. And so you kind of, uh, you have the new center, you recompute the distances to the center, you reassign the points. The points now move between clusters. Reassign the points, recompute, recompute the center, and you end up with a one final option where the centers stop moving. So stop moving, the reassignment stops changing, and you are done. So that's your final uh, for, for this particular uh, set. Um, the Gaussian uh, mixtures uh, quite nicely is a generalization of this. So while k-means <coughs> is uh, a disjoint assignment procedure, so you are assigned either to one cluster or to the other, um, Gaussian mixtures allows for the probabilistic assignment. But it's exactly the same procedure as you can imagine. It's just done with the expectation maximization because we are talking about probabilities. So you have the probability of being assigned. So for example, some of these points, there will be, with probability 80%, there will be assigned to one cluster, with probability 20% assigned to another cluster, once it, the procedure converges. But essentially, it's a, it's a generalization also very commonly used. And finally, the spectral clustering. So spectral clustering, in some sense, makes fewer assumptions, right? So the Gaussian mixtures, you have to make an assumption that the underlying uh, distribution of your data is a mixture of Gaussians, and then you uh, find the assignment. Here, uh, in spectral clustering, all you do is you compute your distances, you compute PCA on that uh, space, you take just the top P, PCA, and then uh, use k-means on the top P, PCA that you have chosen. So that's your, your spectral clustering. It's used very commonly for uh, graphs. And um, in SNF, for example, that's what we use. We use spectral clustering. And you can see the difference here. So while in k-means, the, the closest point uh, is the one that gets clustered, right? So if you have these two clusters, which are kind of what's called on a manifold here, um, the special clustering is actually able to capture that more, more accurately. This is the kind of a Swiss roll uh, idea. So for the clustering approaches, um, 
for all of the ones that I have mentioned, you have to choose the number of clusters. So not beforehand for hierarchical clustering, uh, but you do have to make that decision at some point um, uh, in the hierarchical clustering. None of these procedures make a decision for you. And um, Gaussian mixtures also has a probabilistic assignment. So at every point, once you have new points, you will be able to say probabilistically which cluster it belongs to, which is a nice thing, or which, which uh, component it belongs to. And uh, if they're not linearly separable in, in the sense that you can't just draw a line in between those two clusters uh, very clearly and easily, like in the Swiss wall example, then special clustering is maybe the, be the better choice. Um, I don't talk about the non-parametric uh, clustering approaches here, but there are approaches, um, actually two things I will say. First is that there was a generalization of k-means called x-means, and x-means uh, does uh, the derivation of how many clusters are there for you. It's not as commonly used. I have not seen it used, even though actually it came out uh, from the, um, the lab where I did my PhD, and we all like it. It's not very commonly used, so uh, I figured that, that will not be introducing it here. Uh, another one is actually used, but they all make some kind of assumptions. So there's a kind of Dirichlet process clustering where um, the assumption is that the rich cluster, rich get richer uh, cluster. So you, you might have, if one cluster already has a lot of members, then the new member is more likely to be assigned to that cluster than to other clusters. And that's, that's an assumption that one makes. And unfortunately, <clears throat> even in that case, it was, it was proven that that procedure overestimates the true number of clusters, simply due to the stochastic process of the estimation. So um, deciding on the number of clusters is not a solved problem. And I think it makes sense. It's not a solved problem because um, it actually depends, right? The number of clusters depends on, on your particular objective for, for doing clustering, right? And um, sometimes it's, you can see it by eye and it's very clear and that's great, but uh, a lot of times you want to see what are the small clusters that are combining into the larger cluster or, or something like that. And, and it makes sense to explore the whole space. So. Uh, one of, but, but there are metrics that help you to um, assess what is the best number of clusters. And then, but still, the decision is for the user. So silhouette metric is very, very common. Eigengap, and there are, of course, other ones online. So silhouette statistic was introduced in um, 1987. And basically, it looks at two measures, which makes a lot of sense. So AI is this average distance of the individual point to other clusters, to, to the other uh, things within the cluster. And BI is the average distance to other items of, to other clusters. So you want AI to be small, so things within the cluster to be tight, and BI to be big, and the, the things. And it goes between minus one and one. Here's the silhouette metric. And it goes between minus one and one. Obviously, you want it to be positive because that would indicate that B is greater than uh, A. So here's an example of a particular silhouette plot. So here there are three clusters. And this one cluster, it looks like there are a few points that are actually closer to other clusters than to this cluster. And this, again, is done for uh, clustering techniques such as uh, k-means or hierarchical clustering, where you don't uh, you, you don't have a, an ability to get the probabilistic assignment of clusters, right? So for those kind of clusterings, this is uh, useful. Um, I saw this uh, very nice uh, exploration where people have looked at uh, various uh, kind of simulated distributions and how the different metrics that, uh, uh, how the different metrics compare in identifying the, the right clusters. So, here there are four scenarios, and in the next, uh, the results I will show you all four, but um, here the scenario A is the three clusters in two dimensions, which you see, and scenario B is three clusters in ten dimensions, which I would not really plot. Um, 
Scenario C is four clusters in ten dimensions. Scenario D is six clusters in two dimensions. But notice that while you can distinguish the three clusters, distinguishing within these clusters is very, very hard, right? Within those two very tight kind of pumps. So um, the way that it works is that you have these four scenarios, and this is the silhouette metric, and it really is the most commonly used. And you can see that with scenario A, silhouette has done pretty well, pretty much on top of all the other clusters. Um, whereas in scenario D, it has done the worst. So it was not able to distinguish uh, these uh, clusters within, within the tighter groups. So this is, this is an important thing to keep in mind, that there is no one measure. So in SNF package, SNF tool, we provide two measures. We provide silhouette and we provide the eigen gap, which is the statistic between the, the uh, principal components. Uh, an important thing to consider when you're clustering your data, and I think it's a very, very useful thing, is the stability of your clusters. So the problem with clustering is that if you say there are three clusters in the data, every method will find you with three clusters. Now, whether there were three clusters in the data or not, the method does not concern itself with that. And um, the way to kind of get to it, uh, clo closer to, to assessing what is actually happening with the data, is to resample, take 80% of your data. So I say 80, but it, it can be anything. It can be 70, 90, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. But you get 80, supposedly 80% 80 of your data, sample it, um, and then cluster. And then record if you sample the two points, whether they were in the same cluster or not. And you just have this kind of pairwise matrix that tells you if they were, if this individual, so this is the entry in that matrix, if I and J were sampled together, were they in the same cluster or not? And so if you have a uniform plane, then if you resample 80% of the data, by chance, your, some of the individuals will cluster, but the next time you resample it, they will not cluster. And so the whole point, if you resample it often enough, you will actually get uniform this matrix. And if you get a uniform this matrix, you will know that there is no real, there's one big non-cluster in your data. And uh, what it also allows you to do this approach is to get rid of the outliers. So you will see that uh, sometimes the, um, the kind of patients, for example, that you are trying to cluster, they go between two clusters. So 50% of the time they're in cluster one, 50% of the time they're in cluster two. It means that you simply don't have enough data to actually make that uh, assignment. And maybe you would consider that outlier separately. You would say, I don't have um, uh, the information to confirm that, yes, this individual is of subtype one or subtype two. Whereas some of the individuals will always cluster together. And that's the core of your cluster. And that's something that you can go forth with, uh, with the analysis and, and keep that. So, what are we doing on time? We are doing very well on time. Excellent. Uh, questions for the clustering? So, no questions, not always a good thing. <laughs> so, simple question. Yes. There's, there's no, no reason. reason, there's no, not much of a difference. Uh, Right, you are resampling. The whole point is to give you enough stochasticity in your resampling to see all kinds of the different uh, clusters. And but for to give the individuals or patients to give them enough chance to be sampled together. So that's that's all. It can be eighty percent, it can be sixty percent, fifty percent. You have a favorite number you use. No. No questions. Yes. Um, I think it really depends on the, a lot of times you can use your prior information on uh, what distance would make the most sense. So if your data is continuous, but you are pretty sure that it's not normally distributed, 
then things like Euclidean distance are not the right ones to use. And if people just use it Euclidean distance because that's the most common thing to use, uh, you might suggest Michelinibus uh, distance. Um, but uh, I think the biggest problem is a lot of times this uh, clustering is done for the discovery purposes. And so we don't know what's in the data, right? And so it's really hard to, to, to pick. But you should know that if you use very different measures, uh, distance uh, metrics, and you get completely different clustering, then something is up. Something is up on the data. So maybe it was too sparsely sampled. It's very high dimensional. It was too sparsely sampled. But uh, usually the core, the cores of the cluster should be roughly the same regardless yes. of the measures, because... I think this, this uh, if the concern is that there may be a lot of outliers, I would definitely recommend the core clustering. And then you can do the different thresholds with uh, how many uh, outliers to select. So you want just the, the clusters that... Uh, you know, 50% of the time they come up, or 90% of the time these individuals come up. So this would give you tighter clusters and more outliers. Yes? No? Moving on to classifiers. <laughs> Very good. So um, the goal of the classification is really to, to build a map from the set of predictors, from the set of measurements that you have to the outcome that you care about. It's just a map. It can be a linear map, it can be a nonlinear map, but the point is that you want to have some kind of a predictor which you feed your measurements for the new unseen previously item or individual or patient, and you want uh, to, to be able to predict which class they should belong to. That's the basic uh, premise behind, behind the, the classifiers. So the particular purposes may be predicting tumor grade or uh, predict disease subtype or even impute missing data. So if you uh, figure out what is the model behind uh, your particular measurements, then you can construct using that model, predict what measurement is missing. I, I want to uh, actually highlight this find most important metabolites for predicting disease status because that is a feature selection question. And the feature selection question is actually different from classification. You can do unsupervised feature selection. You can do uh, supervised feature selection. In fact, in some cases, uh, it will come up in this uh, where a classifier does feature selection automatically. Like well, so but but in some sense you want to decouple these questions uh, when you are addressing them. So there are many common classifiers, and you might have heard of all uh, most of them. So support vector machines, uh, logistic regression, lasso, uh, random forest, k nearest neighbors, and naive base. Um, I will only talk about logistic regression and other kind of derivatives of that, random forest, and the k-nearest neighbors. I will not touch on uh, SVMs and uh, naive base today. All right. So um, the logistic regression is um, basically a linear, it uh, identifies, it constructs linear relations from the predictor space to the outcome. And what it tries to estimate is the probability of the class being 1. That's uh, the, the key here. So here you have y, and that's the probability of the class being 1. And uh, it maps this continuum in that space. So if you consider this, you might have seen this. This is a linear regression, right? And that actually predicts the value. So it transforms this linear regression via a logistic function into this kind of the two states between to go between 0 and 1, right? So here you have multiple points. Uh, I took it from the example where you have weight and you're trying to predict obesity, uh, zero. Yeah, no, obesity, yes. And all these red points were considered to be non-obese, uh, and all the red points were considered to be obese based on weight. And then you fit the, the curve, this logistic curve, 
to this data to identify, to then be able to classify new points. Now, um, unlike linear regression, here uh, it done, uh, the fitting of the curve is done using uh, maximum likelihood because there is no direct formula that you can apply to derive the, the beta coefficients. So, um, depending on uh, where you draw, where you draw the line, maybe your classes are skewed. But if not, you would expect that uh, if the probability of uh, class one is below point is predicted to be below estimated to be below 0.5, you would say it's class zero, and if it's uh, above 0.5, you would estimate it to be class one. But uh, that threshold can change depending on your problem. So, um, lasso is actually a regularization on uh, regression. So, lasso is a, is a sparse, sparse, sparse regularization of a regression. So, here you have logistic regression, and it, uh, it gives you L1 penalty. So, what, what that does, it actually adds uh, the sum of the absolute values of the coefficients to the um, to the, uh, the likelihood function. And uh, it performs math, um, variable selection at the same time as estimating. So that's, that's a very important part. Um, so depending on how uh, much you regularize it, so usually you have a lambda parameter that you can either set or estimate. So how much you regularize it, it might give you very few predictors of your outcome. Of course, they will be not as predictive as maybe more, but it gives you a, a feature selection in addition to estimating the, the prediction at the same time. So to give you an intuition behind that, imagine your beta coefficients, which are, which are your coefficients of the importance of the variables. Uh, imagine that this is the original uh, line on which they, if you order them from, the, say, the smallest to the largest, this, this is where your coefficients would lie your regression. If you apply the lasso regularization, L1 regularization, then some of them are set directly to zero. And then the rest of them will be uh, the same as uh, they would have been uh, before. So compared to that, there is a ridge regression, which is an L2 penalty, which actually doesn't set anything to zero. So unlike uh, lasso, ridge regression actually gives you, um, it, it shrinks the coefficients. Where it's helpful is if you have, for example, two uh, predictors which are both equally predictive uh, of the outcome. Lasso would drop one of them, it set one of them to zero arbitrarily. Whereas the ridge regression will give them half of the initial weight. Right? And that's, that's important uh, when, when you actually don't want to. Uh, drop any of the predictors, but actually want to understand how they are related to each other. So elastic net, in some sense, was developed as the best of both worlds. It actually uses a combination of uh, both penalties, L1 and L2, and it optimizes them simultaneously. There's only, well, there's an alpha parameter for that. Um, and depending, so I, I wrote here that if alpha is set to zero, you get loss, so if alpha is set to one, you get rich, it depends on the implementation. Sometimes it's reverse, so be careful and check the implementation that you are using. But the point is that one of the extreme cases is you get the sparsification uh, completely, and in the other case you get, the other extreme you get the shrinkage completely, and just that. But um, the reason why elastic net was used is because it gives you uh, an opportunity to not drop one of the predictors randomly, but to shrink them. But to set some of the really small predictors still to zero. So it has that lasso uh, sense, and it's very, very useful. All right. Um, I will go through all of them and then ask questions for classifiers. They're all different, so it's not uh, kind of the same as the... Um... So before we talk about random forest, it's important to mention decision trees because a random forest is a collection of decision trees. So here is an example of a decision tree, which is a very old uh, machine learning, we call it machine learning because I come from machine learning, but statistical really uh, technique that was used. So here the question is should the 
baseball game uh, be played, and the leaf nodes give you yes or no, and um, the uh, decision is based on all the variables that were collected. So you look at outlook, which has three categories, uh, sunny, overcast, and rainy, humidity, high, normal, and windy, false, and true. And so um, there is an optimization that is done to decide which often uh, for decision trees is greedy optimization, where it's decided, OK, outlook is the most predictive. So uh, first, we'll split on outlook. If it's sunny, we go and we test uh, humidity and wind. It looks, looks like humidity is uh, the next uh, best classifier. So it gives you, um, if the humidity is high, then no. If the humidity is normal, then yes. Um, and if windy, rainy, and windy, then but uh, the problem with this uh, approach, it's actually very useful, and it can be used with small data sets, which is also very uh, helpful in a lot of cases in clinical practice. The problem with decision trees is that they tend to overfit. They tend to not be robust enough as a classifier. So what people have thought of is uh, random forest. And random forest is basically a collection of this uh, classifiers. The way you get different trees in every branch is that you get um, you get a bag of uh, features. So you get a subset of features and you get a subset of samples every time. So you can get a thousand trees and then they will all be different because they all used different uh, uh, features. You sample different features to generate each one of those trees. And then sometimes it's majority voting, sometimes it's a little bit more uh, sophisticated, but basically um, uh, <coughs> you get uh, an ensemble method to put together this uh, various decision trees, right? So the, um, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very nice and very robust algorithm. It also gives you a feature selection and a way, uh, a ranking. So at the end of the day, you can ask, how often was this feature selected when it was uh, given a chance, when it was sampled? How often was it selected as an important feature for splitting? And so you get this feature importance ranking at the end. And actually, in our own work where we tested various methods for feature selection, this was one of the most robust uh, methods. So I, would, I definitely recommend Random Forest as one of the classifiers. Another thing that it does better than logistic regression is it's nonlinear. So we can never guarantee that the relation between our predictors and the outcome is linear. And um, random forest gives an option to model this, these nonlinear relationships uh, compared to all these other methods that are out there. Uh, k nearest neighbors. So k nearest neighbors is also one of the simple, uh, simple classifiers. It works well sometimes, but uh, it's not used as often, again, due to overfitting, right? And it's also very, it's not very stable. If you get new samples here, your decision will change. So it, this uh, in nearest neighbors, as you can imagine, it's quite intuitive. So if you have a new example, you look at what uh, examples, what is the label of the examples the nearest to it. But depending on how many examples you take, you might get different classifications. So say k equals 1 label is plus one. If you set k equals three, you actually have more class two examples and you would set uh, the new example to be class two. And as you get more and more of these examples of which you are not sure what the label of, you might get different classification, which is not really optimal. So um, is this uh, the table which um, tells you the linear logistic regression loss or ridge regression and elastic net uh, will in some sense, derivative of the same uh, logistic regression, and they are they encode linear relationships. Um, allows so n uh, much less than p. That's the number of measurements is much higher than the number of samples. So that's the, that's what uh, that encodes. And uh, logistic regression you simply cannot run if you have few features, uh, if you have lots of features and a few samples. Uh, the other methods you actually can run, uh, including for random forest, you need more because it actually explores the variance in your data, but uh, it still works on very small samples uh, as well. And 
for generalization, again, the, the regularized methods work a lot better. And I have mentioned it before, random forest also works a lot better. And uh, the parametric assumptions uh, about the Gaussian uh, work better than the... So if you, if you can make the parametric assumption, that's great. A lot of times our predictors are in such vast high dimensional space that they are almost as if they were independent and the relationship as if it was a uh, linear. So I think we always try to start with the linear classifiers in my lab to, to see how well we can predict. But then we also try the random forest and SVMs to see if we can improve by introducing nonlinearity into that mapping. Um, and finally, uh, how do you evaluate the classifiers? Well, uh, the most standard are two, the ROC curves. So this is the uh, receiver operating curve. It comes from, from engineering. And uh, basically, if you were to randomly guess, you would get this, uh, this line. So if you, were, if you had a balanced class, uh, then if you were randomly guessing, you would, you would get this diagonal line. So the further away the line uh, of your predictor is from the, the, this line, the better is the model. Um, what, what, what does this line represent? Well, it represents the false positive rate versus the true positive rate. You obviously want to have the most true positives at the fewest, uh, with the fewest false positives, right? So that's why this kind of blue uh, model is really, really good. Now, in my experience, if your model looks like this right away from the first uh, try, it means there's something wrong with the data because uh, this, this model looks too good to be true uh, for a lot of the real practical kind of data sets that we see in real life. But uh, it does happen, so uh, yeah. And Oh, one example of how you would construct this curve is, is if you were moving that threshold. Remember how I mentioned in logistic uh, regression that you had a threshold at 0.5. If you, you were moving it, you would obviously have uh, more true positive or false, true, uh, false, uh, false positives and vice versa. And that's, that's if you were changing that threshold, how well your model would be formed. Precision recall curve is uh, used more often in, in, for example, in clinical practice when we report, we are usually asked for the positive predictive value, which is uh, precision in uh, computer science. And uh, precision is basically the number of true positives compared to all uh, the examples that were classified as a positive, versus the recall, which is the sensitivity, is how many true positives they were out of all the the, the positives that uh, we did and did not capture. So um, this is also this uh, area under this curve being you know, 0.82. Uh, this is a, an incredibly good model. With precision recall, we usually get at 30%, and that seems to be um, where majority of this kind of biological uh, models are. Um, and this is it. I went through all of it, it's amazing, huh? <laughs> so, uh, questions?